Please consider supporting Black Women United, YEG, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, they are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United, YEG, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. Hey, this is Adam from Toronto, and I support Creative Control because Vish is full stop one of the best arts interviewers in Canada, or anywhere in the world, really. He approaches every episode like he's known the artist for years, creating a conversational atmosphere that gets straight to the heart of the work. No one else in podcasting gets it quite right like he does, with a mixture of meticulous research, wise artistic insights, and well-humored personal connections. I proudly support Vish and Creative Control on Patreon. You should, too. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Creative Control with Vish Khanna. Roy Wood Jr. is a tremendously funny and astute comedian based in New York City. Originally from Birmingham, Alabama, Wood is likely best known as a correspondent on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, but has been an acclaimed and practicing stand-up comedian for decades. His latest special is called Imperfect Messenger, which is streaming now on Paramount+. Plus. He's also involved in two podcasts, Roy's Job Fair and Beyond the Scenes. And he's also an actor who's appeared on Better Call Saul, Only Murders in the Building, and Sullivan and & Son, and has feature roles in the upcoming John Hamm film Confess Fletch, and a yet-to-be-titled series about the National Guard produced by Dennis Leary. On Friday, May 27, 2022, at 9 p.m., Roy performs at the Vogue Theatre as part of Just for Laughs Vancouver, and this prompted us to have a conversation about his own trajectory as a comedian, post-9-11 comedy and crowds, how the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd brought certain experiential disparities to light, how Jon Stewart's Daily Show altered the media landscape in a profound and pervasive way, how his parents' work ethic influenced his own, honing his comedy chops in Little League Baseball, why comedy involving athletes is much harder than political satire, future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash Control. Plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario. This is episode 690 of Creative Control, featuring the lovely and talented Roy Wood Jr. with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi Roy, how you doing? Hey, what's up, man? How you been? I'm well. I'm 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 well. I was actually just in your your country for the first time in a long time. I went down to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Of all the places in America, you <laughs> went to the place that was the site of one of the worst racial uprisings over a hundred years ago, and great barbecue. <laughs> it has also, least, great barbecue at least has two distinctions. Have you spent any time in Tulsa? Uh, not outside of telling jokes. I haven't had a chance to really go back there and explore the history, you yeah. know, yeah. Tulsa and Kansas city, you know, kind of those parts of the Midwest, you know, where there were a lot of deeply entrenched African-American cultures. I'm slowly inching my way over to, it's just hard with the daily show because you also got to have a punchline. You can have a story, yeah, but there has to be a joke and where there's a lot of pain, there ain't a lot of jokes. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I can I I felt that a little bit, but I also was only there a couple of days, so I couldn't explore uh the full extent of that stuff, but it was uh yeah, it was a uh, from I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, so it was a 14-hour mm-hmm. travel day and it freaked me out a little bit to be on the planes oh, yeah. and whatnot. Are you traveling around a lot? Not as much, you know, I did my last special in October of 21. So this year I've been kind of focusing, trying to focus a little bit more on writing, traveling less. I haven't been going out on the road and taking a couple of isolated one off dates here and there, but for the most part, no, Like, and it, but it, it has nothing to do with COVID fear or anything like that. It's just comedically, I'm trying to creatively shift gears and 
shift gears into what exactly is what I'm having trouble answering. And until I can answer that question, I don't need to just be on stage for 45 minutes wasting people's time around the country. Yeah. Fair enough. That, that is fair enough. Uh, I neglected to ask you where in the world you are, which is what I usually ask. Uh, I assume oh, you're in New York City. New York City. And how New long York have City you... City is home base. Home base. Uh, obviously, your day job, The Daily Show, is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long have you been in New York? Uh, New York, about seven years. Yeah, it'll be seven years in September. I've been here since 2015. And, and, and you're from Alabama, correct? Yes, yeah, right. from Birmingham. From Birmingham, where? So did you uh, f- did you go right from Birmingham to New York, or did you live in, anywhere else? Oh no, man, I hopscotched all over the place. If we're talking my comedy career, which started in '98, that started in Tallahassee, Florida. Hmm. You know, you know, I did open mics in Birmingham, but for the most part, I was a Florida comic. I only performed in Florida and Georgia for like the first two years of my career. Like I really never left the immediate Gulf Coast bordering states. And then I moved home and I was home for probably another seven or eight years until 07. Then I went to L.A. in 07. I was in L.A. for probably a good five, six years and then came back to Birmingham, went back to L.A., then went to New York. Mm. Wow. Okay. So working around America, does that teach you about the country in ways that, you, that enlightened you? I mean, was it pretty much what you expected being in Florida and in California? I, I think the, the advantage that I feel like I have or have had for most of my career is that by working all over the country, I was, for, especially early on. So like when you're doing open mic in the South, like I wasn't a coastal comedian. I didn't start in a big city. We didn't have stage time every night. So in the South, if you want to perform every night, you have to go to a different city every night. If you want to perform every week, like open mic was once a month outside of Atlanta and Tampa. I'm thinking, I don't remember many places having an open mic on a regular weekly basis, you know, down in that Gulf coast area. So I, I, it just wasn't a lot of places for me to go. So if you're performing in a different city every night, then you're performing for different demographics every night as well. So it could be a really rough room. It could be, you know, a bar that's loud and chaotic. It could be old people. It could be mainstream. It could be black. It could be college students. You don't know. So as you start developing and, and that affected how I wrote my material early on. So now what is the joke that all of these demos will laugh at? That's the joke I have to write. Mm. And so that's the kind of comedian that I eventually became is, you know, comedy to a degree, it's sociology and you have to understand people and you have to know what people are thinking, what they are feeling and, you know, what they're going through. And so through that, I was able to, you know, connect with people a little bit more broadly and it gave me more understanding of nuance, you know, in terms of what people feel, what people think, et cetera, et cetera. So that was something that really created a balance for me. So by the time I got to LA, I understood what middle America, so my writing habits remained the same and I've never had to really change up anything mm-hmm. or consider, well, oh, I'm in Montana today. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. It was Montana. That's the same as the Eastern Tennessee mountains to me, you know, in terms of the makeup and the ideology of the people, you know, there's cultural differences, but in terms of living rule and the further off the grid, these people are the same, you know, that's no different than playing the rural parts of Georgia, you know? So, you know, it, it's, it's a long answer, but you know, what I'm saying is that because I was forced into so many different cultural situations early on in my career, it, I developed writing habits that became a little bit more, you know, inclusive of other people by just by the nature of need, fiscal survival. Yeah. I need to get rebooked here. Yeah. So I got to be funny, but it's Paducah, Kentucky. <laughs> so, you know, you got to make sure that it's decent. Well, by that token, I mean, we hear comedian. I have interviewed a, a, a million comedians and I've 
studied comedy. So you hear phrases like, uh, you know, tough, tough crowd or what's the room like, you know, and, and these questions. But by an extension of what you're saying, I wonder if those sort of measures are really a microcosm of what the world is like that day. So if something's mm-hmm. going on in the city or the atmosphere generally, do you feel like that? Because I, I get what you're saying. Like a room is a room. A city is a city. They're kind of the same on some level. We're all human beings. Uh, we might have different uh, different cultural atmospheres or whatnot. But yeah, lean a little different politically. Yeah, and we're all different yeah. socio-culturally, politically. But... I assume as a comedian, every night you know, like, well, what's going on today? What do we? What happened in the world? How is that going to inform the mood in the room among the people? Do you think that's a fair way of looking at it? Yeah, but also, all right, what happened today? What happened today is probably something that's happened before. Mm. And so we know how to unpack it to a degree. It's just where are you as a people or as a, as a culture or as a town, where are you? in the cycle of joy and grief as a collective. Right. And as a comedian, you know, you try to find material that meets people somewhere within that pocket. You know, it's no different than performing at a, at a big college after they've lost the big game or after they've won the big game, you know, or, you know, I wasn't here during this era, but like New York city during nine 11, Okay, well, that was the resilient comedy show era, which birthed a lot of that tough crowd, which birthed a lot of that politically incorrect pushback. Here's what we need to do type comedy. So a lot of that stand up to a large degree can sometimes be reflective of the times that we're in. And it can either go with the flow or it can go against the flow. You know, in that era. Like if we're going early 2000s, like 9-11, like Mm -hmm. around that time, right? Comedy up until that point was all with the flow and hey, it's all good jokes and everything's fun. And then 9-11 hits and America becomes extremely politically divided again. This is right off the heels of the George Bush, the, the stolen election. So there was already division off of that. So comedy became a little bit more counterculture. Then probably about 10 years later, the alt alt comedy started kind of, well, alt was already bubbling under the surface. I'm not going to act like it's something new, but it shifted into the mainstream because people, you, you, anger is not a sustainable emotion for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. So people's tastes change. Then Trump hit. And then the comedy started getting a little counterculture again, yeah. similar to 9-11. So when you look at the times we're in now, you know, every question is, is comedy under attack? Can you do that joke? What if you get banned and canceled? If you say that thing, people don't want to hear that. thing. We weren't having this conversation about comedy 10 years ago. Yeah. So what does that mean? So, so, so moods change, yeah. taste change, yeah. societies change. But the comedians don't. There's just different types of comedians people prefer at a particular time. So, you know, if you're tired of hearing particular jokes that don't lean into the things that you believe in, the things that fulfill you, you're going to seek and uplift the comedians who do. Therefore, you see more of those types of comedians in the mainstream and in the zeitgeist now. Also, cable isn't the sole gatekeeper of comedy anymore. Neither is late night, really. So Mm. you can find your favorite comic on a streaming site if you want to, or that comic might just put out a special on YouTube that you never hear about that also does 10 million views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you started off by saying, uh, you know, what what is going on? It may have happened before. Like there's some precedent to what we're going through. But then you cited a few things there, uh, 9-11, Trump. Now we're in this pandemic. For some of us, these are completely unprecedented. They've left us uncertain, unsteady in ways that we just, I don't know if it's, well, I mean, this pandemic, I think, has been a a, a leveling force. We're all technically on the same, on the same shaky ground. Trump was not an American phenomenon. I think it happened, that happened, and we feel it here in Canada. We, We feel it everywhere. 
I mean, the whole world has been, we've seen this rise of, of normalizing that kind of behavior, that kind of brazen racism, bigotry, like that kind of whatever you want to call it. So all I'm getting at is this feels, and this might be naive. I am a student of history on some level, but doesn't it feel to you like this is a lot of stuff most of us haven't encountered? And that's why we're kind of, there's this low level stress, <laughs> maybe heightened more than yes. usual. Like, doesn't this feel unusual to you? Yeah, because I think the body blows are coming a little bit more frequently and in succession. Also, when you lay poverty underneath that and just the economic crises in America, you know, when I say people, I'm speaking more about Americans. I don't perform overseas for the most part. I don't get enough time off from Comedy Central to do that. So I don't take the temperature of yeah. other places like you know, I'm an American comedian. I'm here to talk about what's happening around the corner. You know, one day I will expand to all of that. But for now, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. But if you look at nine eleven, you could you could argue the housing crisis in oh eight and the bubble bursting or whatever. I, I wouldn't. But the housing crisis, I, I don't really count that one because that was more. It's only a crisis if you had a fucking house. If you never afforded a house, there was no housing crisis for you. You were still, you know, moseying along paying rent. But when I, when I, the, to me, the thing with the pandemic, with Trump, with 9 11, if we just use those three as examples, those are collective emotional experiences that we had as a people. Regardless of what the thing is, it's we are all connected in a moment together as a people. Now, how we all react on the other side of that is different. And in that comes the humor and the analysis. But that also gives us the ability to seek out the things that soothe us. And I think that's where social media plays a big role in heightening a lot of the psychosis that we go through, but also being a salve to a degree Yeah, for some of it, too, because you can go, oh, my God, everything is happening. Everything's burning all at once. But then also. I can find a web page or a community, you know, to be around and to be with, you know, because I think it's also perspective as well, you know, because like you can tell me that that there's a problem with mass shootings. Right. Yeah. And you can say, oh, my goodness, there's all these mass shootings and it's terrible. OK, it is. But then if you say that to a person and I'm including myself in this, considering the zip code in Birmingham where I grew up. Mm -hmm. But if you say that there's these mass shootings to people that have grown up around multiple shootings, the barometer for danger or fear or panic is different. You know, a lot of people dealing with trauma for the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the first time the sky ever fell, fell for y'all. It's the first time you ever had to sit still. First time the pandemic really started, you know, it, you know, COVID didn't care about your, your social class, social right. status, you know, right. That's right. So for a lot of people, the struggle and pain that the world is starting to present is new, but there's a lot of other people in this country who've already been broke. They've already been dealing with their own healthcare issues. They've already been dealing with a number of crises. They've already been dealing with crime. So mm -hmm. it's not the same for how they, it is a shared experience COVID, but not everybody's going to carry it the same. So yeah, absolutely. If I'm, you know, so if I'm on stage, I'm not going to, I'm not going to assume that we are all, you know, you know, in the same place. I mean, hell, I did a show in Florida a couple of months ago and like there was no masks on. Nobody had a mask on. And I had just come from New York where everybody had a mask yeah. on. You know, the country's that different in the matter of a, you know, a three hour flight. Oh, you know, I did a connecting flight from uh, Alberta to Denver. Oh, sorry, I, I I did a flight from Edmonton to Calgary and then Calgary to Denver, and that was all mass. But then Denver to Tulsa, the the flight attendants, they were all like, oh, you can take them off. Oh, I hate wearing them. You know, you don't have to wear them now. And I was like, <laughs> this is an airplane. Like, I was really hesitant to even go on this trip because of that. And uh, 
But anyway, you're absolutely correct. I, I, I want to retract my notion of this being the pandemic being a leveling force because you're right. I think uh, it isn't a leveling force. It no, just feels that it, way for those of us who are privileged. No, what no, what I'm saying, I'm not saying, and I'm, and I'm not disagreeing with you. What I'm yeah. saying is that it is a leveling, but not all of us are carrying it the same. Yes, it's, the, it's 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 the way someone will come up to a to a poor person and go, you know, isn't it just crazy out there? Uh, my fuck, it's been crazy. Yes. Yeah. It's been crazy to me. It, this is new to you. Yeah. And yes, this is another level of crazy, but I am not shocked. You know, I, and I talked about that in my, in my first, my first hour special was the thing that I found most insulting about this racial awakening or whatever was how surprised people were. It's really like that. Where have you been? Yeah. Are your eyes not like it's one thing to just go, oh, it's nothing I can do. I'm, you know, I'm like, would you rather someone hate you or not see you? What's worse to be hated or to just straight up be invisible to people? And I think that was the first time that I felt like a lot of black issues were finally becoming, you know, visible. You know, George Floyd is a great example of what we're talking about. Yeah. Oh my Lord, the cops are killing people and putting their knees on their, huh? I'm sorry. Where have you been? Let me rattle off a long list of names. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have one group, you know, white people going, Oh my God, this is ridiculous. Let's all do something. Kumbaya. Let's try and fix it. What can I do to help? I want to be an ally. And then you have black people going, that's what we've been trying to tell you. Yeah. But the collective truth is that, yes, cops are killing people and body cams are finally bringing a lot of that funk to the top. And it's starting to slowly create some degrees of reform. It's interesting, though, because I think in asking people to be a little more cognizant and self-aware and get out of their oblivious bubbles, it has seeded a lot of resentment. I think people start to... And I think they're angry at themselves because they didn't see the things you're talking about. I think people pride themselves on being mostly pride themselves on being knowledgeable and and aware of things like those of us who are racialized or whatever and have endured s extremes of racism or microaggressions, you know, things like uh, and I'm not putting myself in uh, I've, I've been fortunate. I've not been put in particular harm's way, but just like I distinctly remember 20 years ago going up to a counter at the in the uh, for a, a store at a in the town I lived in at the time, university town, and I gave the guy my name, and he just muttered, "Oh, you people and your names," as a joke. Mm -hmm. Like he, it was a perfectly benign interaction, right? And I and he was making what he thought was just a joke, and I complained eventually. Like I left the store being like, "I can take a joke. I'm a fan of comedy," but then I was like, "You probably shouldn't say that at a store." to a person of color, like even, you know, and I think there's yeah. a lot more of that. Hey, the thing you said probably shouldn't say that. And I think it's created this weirdly. It has the, the opposite effect. People get angry at you for calling them out on something that you did. Cause I think they recognize it's wrong, <laughs> yep. but they, they're mad at themselves. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's a, and you know, when you look at feminism and, abuse and the way that men relate to women, you know, there's definitely something similar yeah. in that, Hey, that joke was a little sexist or, Hey, please don't do that. And, you know, man who has never been challenged on anything when it comes to respecting women is going to go, what do you mean? We're just a joke. We're just yeah. making a joke. It's like, nah, man, you can't carry it like that anymore. And again, that is a collective experience of one group saying enough is enough. And another, and another group finally being forced to listen. We're both here in this moment, you know, because of things that have happened, but we're not entering the moment from the same headspace, but we're all at the table. Yeah. And I think that's way better off than what we've been collectively over the past few, 
past few generations. I'm glad you brought up just a joke because I want to talk a little bit about you mentioned 9/11 too, which was not on my mind before we started this conversation. I hadn't I didn't think we were going to talk about <laughs> that in any way, but well that created a lot of patriotism and xenophobia in this No, country, it did. It's which led to a lot of the anti-immigration stuff absolutely. that we were that followed after that, you know. So it, it, yeah. But I want to talk about comedy a little bit because I grew up loving comedy and my comedy uh, touchstones are, uh, and I grew up a fan of punk rock and music. So Saturday Night Live was this weird amalgam of everything. Like, you know, sometimes obscure or edgy or uh, mus musical guests with, com with lots of comedy. Letterman's huge for me. Conan was huge for me. Then like things like the Ben Stiller show with Bob Odenkirk and, and Stiller and Janine Garofalo, uh, David Cross is anyway, all these folks like just entered my, my, my head. But John Stewart's daily show post 9-11 in particular, was a real bomb, I guess, because I took a lot of refuge in the satire. It, it seemed like a way to... Someone was taking my frustration and anger and doing something with it, and it was satisfying. But whatever I'm coming from, though, when you, you mentioned just a joke, what I've noticed, and I don't know if you have perspective on this, you're still at The Daily Show... It seems to me that that show and its aesthetic has infiltrated culture in a way that I was not expecting. And in the wrong hands, I feel like that same kind of comedy attitude, comedic approach and, and, and ideas of satire. Like I see it in every commercial now. I see it. I see actual legitimate newscasts where the guy or the, the person will make a, a smarmy not smarmy, but like a sarcastic remark during a newscast. Like you'll you'll see Anderson Cooper mm -hmm. make like a John Stewart level joke, or Jake Tapper. They just have this tone where the show was making fun of them for not doing. Yeah. The, and then it, those shows became, I think, this is my theory, kind of became the Daily Show. And I see it in all culture now. And then the just a joke thing is with Trump and and his ilk, Republicans. They'll say the most horrible stuff. They'll get called on and say, oh, I was just making a joke. Like they weaponized comedy. And this, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a rant and I'm, you might disagree. No, 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 no. Okay. So where I'm coming from is what, what do we do with this? Cause I, I, I used to like, I'm like, wait, they took, now I'm like, they took my, they took the thing I liked and they're mm -hmm. using it and it's for the wrong reasons. And, or they, they've didn't understand they were the butt of the joke. Really, you know, the media and they they they're like, we like the daily. We're going to be more like the Daily Show is where I'm coming from. Does that not seem odd to you? It a little, but I think it's just the evolution of the industry to a degree. Number one, cable news became within a joke is an opinion, mm -hmm. right? Cable news by nature from 9-11 till now has become more opinionated because, you know, that's if we really want to dig into the, if we really want to dig into crates, a lot of the opinion based quote unquote news content that's put out on a lot of major media outlets, it's a byproduct of debate culture, which was created by sports, right? not news. Right. That's true. You know, yeah. let's argue the news all day since there is no new news to cover. Right. And that became more interesting than repeating the same news over and over. Like headline news used to be a 30 minute loop that would change one story every two hours. And over the course of the day, the stories change, but the news in 30 minutes that's relevant now. And now the next thing you know, it's Nancy Grace yelling about, <laughs> about something. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. the evolution of opinion, the, the evolution of the permeation of opinion into news was an inevitable byproduct of the need for ratings. So with opinions comes the need to be snarky about your opinion right, right, from time to time. Right. So then jokes start kind of pull, you know, pulling into that. John Stewart was the tip of the sword of that. But I think the other thing that I think happened that emboldened a lot of mainstream media talent to throw a joke, to throw some snark, to have a gotcha interview type moment with someone is all of the other shows that started coming after Daily Show, you know, from Colbert Report, mm -hmm. which then, you know, eventually Sam B had her own thing. Bill Maher was doing Politically Incorrect. Tough crowd, maybe, but tough crowd. Colin uh, Quinn. To me, that's kind of more 1.0. Yeah, with Colin. Yeah. But if we're talking like right now, you got Full Frontal, Sam B, you know, Seth Myers does his thing. Jim Jeffries up until about a year or two ago. 
So there's a influx of shows which are low key all John Stewart's children. Absolutely. No, I mean, <laughs> Stephen Colbert, Sam B., uh, Jordan Classic. Even you, us. Yeah, you, even us and Trevor. Trevor right really? now. Yeah, I mean, some, I just don't, there's so much going on that I don't think we dwell on it that much. Uh, and it's hard to talk about the significance of something while it's still happening. I just want you to know, I know you're part of the, the show now, and I'm not just saying this to uh, butter you up. I just think that show is more significant then maybe we recognize like Simpsons level pervasiveness is where I'm coming from. Like at the peak of the Simpsons, it mm -hmm. changed like hip hop, like mm -hmm. just vernacular changing tone changing. Like it yep. changed the tone. And I think the daily show right now, I think we're still in the wake of it. I don't think it's gone away. I, like I say, I see it on sports shows. I see the dynamic. I mean, I'm not saying Ernie Shack and uh, yeah. Charles and uh, Kenny are doing the Daily Show, but I'm just like, there's so much more comedy everywhere because people, I, and I appreciate yes. it, but I do think the Daily Show in particular got us somewhere, uh, and and that's where we're still at mostly. Does that make sense? That that yeah, it makes perfect sense, and I'm saying all of that is a byproduct of one channel seeing someone else do it, and then go. <laughs> yeah, I think you might be onto something there. I want to ask you about your own uh, <laughs> your own entry into comedy. You mentioned Birmingham. You talked about how you got going there and and the circuit basically that you wound up in. But tell me about your household. Um, like I said, I got to through weird circumstances. My parents were. My dad would come if I was watching Carson Johnny Carson, not Carson Daly. If I was watching Johnny Carson, my dad would come down and be like, what are you doing? Go to bed. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a teenage, like, you know, I'm like in your house. I'm not doing drugs. Can't I just watch comedy? Like, what's going on? But but they were just like, you should be a doctor, a lawyer. You know, for I'm a first generation. They're from India. They want you to do the straight and narrow thing. You know, they don't, they could see I was into music and arts and here I am. Uh, I think they're okay with it. But every once in a while, my mom is like, you know, you could still go to medical school. I'm like, no, I think I think that ship has sailed. Did you have a lot of comedy in your house? Was it engaged with? Like everyone, were you watching comedy? Did you have a lot of support for what your, your interest was? Yeah, I mean, my parents were both, you know, my dad, they're both college professors, college educated. Between my two parents, there's six degrees. Yeah. So let's just start right there. So that's where their mind is. Their mind is on education and growth. So, you know, I found a love for baseball early on and that was something I always enjoyed doing. So I did that. Then, you know, for a while I fell in love with, you know, when comedy central first signed on as a network, that was, I was a big deal because that, you know, like, because up until that point, the only time you saw stand up comedy was one weekend a year when HBO would give a free preview weekend and for the young people back in the cable only days of accessing media once a year, HBO Showtime and Cinemax would just unlock their, everybody had HBO for a weekend and they would put on nothing but the best shit. And it would be either George Carlin one year or Sinbad or they would do like, um, I hate that I'm not remembering the name of the the fundraiser that they did. Was it Comics Come Home? I think it's Comics Come Home. It was mm -hmm. Dennis Leary and Whoopi Goldberg and Robin Williams. Like it's just a murderer's row yeah. of comedians raising money. You know, there's um, there, there were times, you know, I can remember, you know, like with my family, the only thing we ever really did together as a family was on Sundays. Sunday mornings we would have breakfast and we would all read the Sunday paper. And that really helped to shape, you know, just viewing the world and just seeing, you know, like as a youth, you start with the comic strips and sports. And then as you get older, you read Metro State and a little bit of the national news. And then when you hit teenage years, you need a job. Now you're fi flipping through the classifieds. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you you evolve through the papers. You got older. And then sometimes on Sunday nights, my dad would watch 60 Minutes. We would watch that together. My father was a journalist, you know, and he did. Pro he, prominent he one. He did radio commentary. He was a prominent journalist, was he not? My, my dad definitely 
he he gave his pound of flesh yeah. to black people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, going all the way back to you know the riots in Soweto in South Africa, Rhodesian Civil War, Vietnam. He was embedded yeah. with black platoons. So my father never knew how to you know, and then and then coming from all of that into you know covering the civil rights movement, like you leave Vietnam and come right into Dr. King getting shot at, yeah. like it's you know straight chaos. So he's covered so many black movements that it was hard for him to be serious, to be funny. Yeah. I just think, I don't know, knowing what I know now as a man, I think the world beat the sense of humor out of him. I don't remember my father laughing often. He might have a laugh or two with a friend that was over at the house and they're just telling a story, but I don't remember him just as a generally joyous man. I see. Like, you know, he didn't, he was not quick to watch Eddie Murphy. You know, I couldn't stay up late enough to watch Saturday Night Live. But at the time when Comedy Central first signed on, SNL reruns were a staple for their channel in the mornings. SNL and syndicated stand-up comedy shows from like Evening at the Improv and they had the A-List with A.J. Jamal. They had a show called Stand Up, Stand Up with Wally Collins. And it was just clips of stand up all day. I damn near wouldn't go outside and play in the summer hmm. because I wanted to watch that shit. And I was just locked in on it. Was I, for, I neglected to mention a huge show for me was in Living Color. Was that show significant for you? Did you watch that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Living Color was, I call that an exclusion show where if you didn't watch that show the day before, then you literally were not allowed like like you couldn't sit at the lunch table at school the next day we all talked about it we all copied all of yeah, the you characters have nothing to contribute to this conversation so shut the fuck like my son was go eating sit over there <laughs> my son i caught my son at the counter the other day and they were eating pickles right out of the jar i was first of all i was like what the hell are you doing get a bowl but then i thought of damon wayne's character the which you know in yeah, retrospect Antoine. The unhoused yeah. Antoine carrying what? Anyway, it was quite gross. It was quite an amazing <laughs> feat of comedy that they. And oddly enough, ironically enough, I think yeah, last night on on one of the film channels, my wife walked in. She's like, "What are you watching?" I'm like, "I'm gonna get you suckers on." So I'm sitting on the couch for a couple of minutes until the basketball game comes back. You know. So anyway, sorry, I, weird tangent. I just I didn't want to neglect. How significant, uh, in particular, Keenan Ivory Wayans was to... Oh, of course. There was a huge influence, yeah. you know, but, but if the question is my house, then it's it's my experience with my parents versus my experience, you know, with myself. With me, it was all comedy, you know. I had a little comic strip that I used to write that I would, like, photocopy and pass around in middle school when I was in the sixth grade. Oh, wow. <laughs> And then I got, uh, and then I got transferred to a black school in the seventh grade. I tried that shit. They're like, "Motherfucker, we ain't finna read this shit." <laughs> like, okay, well, so much for being the next Jim Davis. <laughs> so when do you? There's a fine uh, for a comedian. I think. I mean, I think if you're funny and try to make jokes, as I did in school, and as I do in conversation, I try. When you when you tell a joke, I think you alluded to this earlier. You are expressing an opinion. There's something opinionated about someone who comes up with a joke. They think what they've got to say is is interesting enough that it might be worth sharing. Do you remember that? Tra so there's that transition, and I assume that's a big step to getting on stage. Is not only do I seem to have a nice rapport when I'm in a room and can make my friends and you know my my classmates or whoever laugh. I think I can make strangers laugh. That's how strong my, my opinions are. Do you remember that? Do you have any sense memory of where that came, that enlightened you? Where you're like, I think I can actually go up in front of people I don't even know and express something that will move them in some way. Mm. I would say that playing baseball was the first time that I made oh. strangers laugh. But the connection of oh, I could do stand-up comedy, would be years later, six, seven years later, when I was like, oh, okay, well, I can do, 
I think I can do this. Let me just leave town. <laughs> so your teammates in the dugout kind of thing is who yeah, you're making? Yeah, it's two yeah. different mile markers before I went to stand to the two different mile markers in my life that emboldened me to the point that you're asking about. Yeah. So when I played baseball in high school, I sucked. So I was a bench warmer. Your job as a bench warmer on the team is to heckle the other team to get into ah. their head, to demoralize them so that they underperform on the field. So it's just straight up verbal bullying for two hours in the sun. <laughs> 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 and I took I've, pride I've in never, that. I've never, I've never heard baseball described that way. That's that's a new. Well, it's the uh, South. It's black schools, and, and so right. you know, you play in a black school district. Like you are, you know, that's just black culture, though. You know, just playing yeah. the dozens and talking dozens. trash. Yeah. And, yeah. So we're playing the dozens across the field, yelling dozens while a game is happening, and if you can make one of the parents laugh that was like a punchline <laughs> but if you could make the umpire call time out that was a standing ovation <laughs> and the yeah. umpire would never would never take his mask off like he would just look over at our dad like, hey simmer down over there now simmer down I assume which meant I assume you're some, making me laugh and you're distracting <laughs> me from my job. I assume some of these jokes were pretty uh people specific. Sight gags maybe uh the way they looked. Uh do you, 100%. not 100%. not not maybe worth sharing. We wouldn't get it if you're Oh, I'd get canceled. <laughs> if I if I told you the stuff that I was yelling, but it was also 1993 level humor. So think about what black humor was in yeah. 1993 and it was, it was pretty close. It, like, I mean, if the guy was bigger or heavy set, we would make a boom every time one of his feet hit the ground. Boom, 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 boom. Right. And then when he ran to first base, if he got a hit, we would go boom, 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 boom. Just acoustic, like just anything. So yeah. I showed up to games with the intent of trying to get the parents to laugh. Right. So that was thing one. And that felt good. It felt good. So it was something I took pride in. And when I was working in Tallahassee, while I was in school, I got a job at this restaurant, Golden Corral. And at Golden Corral, I figured out ways to introduce myself to each table that was funny. And so if that was funny, then I would use that joke on another table hmm. and the table I just left. They didn't hear me do that joke at the other table. And so you start learning people's tendencies, you know, if you have kids or not, if you're eating alone or not, there's just certain things. There's just certain truths about certain human beings that do not change regardless of race. And once I understood those things, then I could find humor to exploit that and make you smile upon greeting you and hopefully get a better tip. So huh. then by the end of my shift, I had five or six different jokes, you know, to use, you know, if it was, if it was a game day and Florida state had a home game, then nine times out of 10, most of the white families that are coming in that store are there for the game. So we're going sports today. And we're going to do Bobby Bowden jokes. And if you don't like Florida State and you're rooting for the other team, we're going to do Steve Spurrier jokes. And, you know, it's either how much you love Florida State or hate Florida State. And so then when you take that same premise on the road years later as a comedian, you can just remove Florida State and insert whatever regional team everybody loves or hates and the joke still plays. That's remarkable. So, so you're working the instead of working rooms, in a sense, you're working one room, but you're working each table. And, yeah, uh, imagine workshopping a joke one customer at a time. And then when you finally get the nerve to get on stage and it's a room full of strangers, you're like, ah, oh, this is Golden Corral. <laughs> because right. you look at the people. I see a two top on a date. I used to serve couples on a date. Oh, y'all look good. Y'all oh, Oh, y'all sitting on the same side of the table. This relationship was new. <laughs> right. So chuckle, in the moment, yeah, that's great. So 
those things, you start learning that if you can meet people where they are, then they'll go wherever you want to take them. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of how I approached it. And so by the time this idea of trying comedy, the only thing I feared was getting booed. I feared the rejection, but to curb that I performed out of town. I was living in Tallahassee, but I went back home to Birmingham to do open mic. If I suck, I don't live here right now. No one, I don't have to see you in the streets tomorrow. Yeah. Which is also why I went to Atlanta once a month. Right. To do open mics. I mean, you have the work ethic there, clearly. Do you have a sense, uh, or I'm sure you do. Do you remember when it felt like, I don't have to work at the Golden Corral anymore. I can do this. Uh, did you get any particular writing gigs or, or, or anything like that where you're like, okay, this is it. This is something I can do. No, I was I was 19 when I started, bro. When I graduated college, I had done nothing but stand up the whole time I was in school, my last two years of school. So I never did an internship, so I couldn't get a job in journalism because I didn't have enough experience. All I had was a degree and some campus paper clippings, but that's not enough. Mm-hmm. You got to like journalism, man. You got to go after that. Like I had a classmate at a classmate who was the weekend anchor at NBC while we were still enrolled. Like you got to like, that's what you got to come out of college with. Yeah. Already yeah. been employed type shit. Yeah. So comedy was the easy choice to just keep doing. I started doing morning radio, you know, as a way to kind of build my audience as well. Morning radio was, you know, as as Tracy Morgan once referred to Saturday Night Live, it was the Dagobah system. And that's where I learned how to be funny fast and quick and without thinking about the words before they come out of your mouth, you know. And that's where the baseball heckling came back into play because I started doing prank calls and all of that stuff. And so you just, you learn people. And once you learn people, just how we move and how we relate, then I think everything else kind of falls into place. So by that token, and I'm like, you mentioned some of the, the jobs you had in retail, if you will, and, and restaurants and all those sorts of things. Is the daily show uh, one of your first day jobs per se, like in terms of comedy or did you do other stuff? Uh, no, I'd say radio was a day job. I did mornings for almost oh, yeah, 12 sir. years while I was doing stand up. But in terms of like the comedy comedy world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I did a sitcom for three years on TBS called Sullivan and son, but which multicam sitcoms have a bit of a nine to five feel to them in terms of the scheduling of it all. But yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Daily Show probably is the first like regular grounded <laughs> day job. So was your audition per se someone or people from the show coming to watch you do stand up? How did this even come about? It came about there was they were starting to look for new correspondents and Trevor is good friends with Neil Brennan. Oh, yeah. And so Neil dropped my name to Trevor and he dropped my name to the producers. And at the time for that entire year, and this is just how luck works, I guess, preparation plus time or whatever the hell I was doing. I wasn't I, Sullivan son had gotten canceled. Um, I was working the road. I wasn't getting many auditions and I wasn't landing anything in L.A. And so I started doing a lot of stuff on ESPN. I had a couple of friends that booked some shows over there. They did me some favors and they got me on Sports Nation. They got me on His and Hers. Bo Money Jones had a podcast at the time. And like, like they were, I started appearing on ESPN probably, I don't know, once a month, twice a month, which is a lot yeah. for a stand up comedian on that yeah. network and comedy. I would still argue that comedy in sports is harder to do than politics and comedy because just sports has more sensitive people and it, it, they're just more landmines when it comes to sports, which is why you don't see a lot of stand up comedians being integrated into any of that stuff over there. And most of the opinions that come 
are strictly on the thing. It is strictly a fact based. Of it. Here's my opinion and here's why. And you have to back it up with data and metrics and all of this other shit. Whereas on a political network, you can just go, yeah, he stinks. Isn't he stupid? <laughs> and I, I'm no smiling. Be- I'm smiling because as you're talking, I'm, I'm a huge Norm Macdonald fan. And I'm remembering his ESPN award show monologue. Have you ever seen that? Mm, oh, the ESPYs joint. Oh, the ESPYs. Sorry. Yeah, the ESPYs. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I don't it's know. If I, I've never seen it anyone. Yeah. I've never seen anyone do that. Like you say, sp- athletes are pretty sensitive, but they're tough. Like that sensitivity is, is, is you know, insecurity is weird. You put on a front, right? Like they're tough, huge, strong dudes and this 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 tall canadian comedian is just going after them and fearlessly mm-hmm. and uh i can't think of too many other people who, who have done that sorry i just i it just brings a smile to my face uh i got to know norm a little bit and i miss him very much but that just that level of fearlessness i just i can't think of anyone else who would do that except did you find that would you go after athletes when you were on espn no, no, no. And that's my point. So yeah. that's not my MO. That's not my style. Yeah. So ESPN, my point is that for a year, yeah. I had to perform comedy with some of the tightest guardrails on oh, television, yeah. which is don't piss off the sponsors. Don't piss off the athletes. You know, don't piss off the network. And then, of course, there's still the usual parameters of anti-hatred like you can't do jokes at the expense of anyone you can't shit on a fan base they don't even allow that like if you if you look at if you look at espn the people that are the most bombastic they're still correct like like stephen a smith will attack a team but he rarely attacks the fans the fans are the viewers no he goes after players for sure if you, think, you go after a player, yeah. you go after a team, you go after the organization, yeah. but to go after the fans, like that's not, that ain't Golden Corral. It's interesting though. And that was the play at Golden Corral. When he goes in on a player though, isn't that a surrogate for going after, not, I'm not saying he's going after the fans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. No, absolutely. You rile the fans up, but even still, it's not rooted in jokes. It's rooted in facts and opi- it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. opinions that are rooted in facts that you can choose to spin however you want. There's no blind insults on ESPN and comedy can be blind insults. Political comedy to a degree can be blind into you're stupid. Trump's having sex with his daughter. Anyway, yeah, you don't have to provide a bunch of it's, it's, you're going to take a tweet and spin it. You're going to take some clip of Trump rubbing her shoulder and spin it. And you're going to create the joke there. And it's funny, but that's not, Facts, not no. the same as sports. Right, right. He's a bad player because he turned his back on his team. And two years ago, when he did that, he did it with that team. Like it's. You're talking about ben, you're talking about Ben Simmons. Pillars. You're talking about Ben Simmons. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, what I learned in that space was to have humor that dodges all of those different landmines. Yeah. And it was very. It was. It was new. It was something interesting to learn. My point is, is that by the time the Daily Show came around and that audition came, I was ready. Yeah. Because I felt like I had been trying to tell jokes in a far more difficult environment than politics. They hated Dennis Miller when he did Monday Night Football. Oh, yeah. They did not like him. Right. But Dennis, the sportscasters didn't like him. I mean, Dennis gets under people's skin. But even back then, he was just doing what a comic was supposed to do. He did the job. I'm going to show up and be snarky and I'm going to say slick stuff in my, you know, in my style. Yeah. You know, Dennis, Dennis resonated with me a lot as a as a kid. But in retrospect, um, like you're talking about some measure of inclusivity, some measure of like, I'm going to do my bit here on whatever the context and the goal isn't to alienate anyone or make people feel like they're out of the know on some level. Whereas Dennis's whole thing was when I was growing up, it appealed to me because I was trying to figure out who I was. And he had this very hyper intellectual way of like 
completely obscure historical references and all this kind of like, you know, like I don't even to this day, I can think of bits of his and I don't even know what the references are, but I would look them up. I would look them up after to be like, what, you know, what is he talking about? Some obscure Pink Floyd album that I didn't know at the time or whatever, you know? Anyway, you seem to be aware of the fact that having the audience know what you're talking about and not feeling alienated, that's a key part of what your role is potentially or, or how you've designed your approach to comedy. Is that fair? I can trick you into agreeing with me or get you to listen to something you wouldn't expect me to. I mean, you know, I'm, yeah. I talk a lot of shit in strange places, man. So, you know, I'm going around talking about police reform and a lot of places where people don't agree with my perspective on it. You have an extended bit about but, how delicious McDonald's is, and I've not heard anyone say that in this day and age. Okay, but then you start you start with that, <laughs> and then you come back around the corner from that yes. with police reform. Yes, or it's amazing. Why black music is a window into what black people are going through, and if you'd listen to our music, you wouldn't be so surprised at how angry and sad we are as a people. Yeah. But first, I'm going to give you a McDonald's joke. <laughs> It's amazing. No, it, yeah. So that that was always the approach. But also, I'm not on stage to yell at you. I'm also just trying to give you an idea of other ways that you could be looking at these things that you have entrenched in your brain to only be one way. Yeah. So if I can present, you know, a different POV, then I think I'm in a good place. Yeah. Earlier, you mentioned uh, Dennis Leary. And you also mentioned that you're not doing road work as much. And I look at your upcoming projects. Uh, I look at the upcoming stuff you've got going on. Dennis Leary is mentioned in this biographical info as exec producing some project you're working on. Roy, yeah, uh, National Guard pilot, yeah. Yeah, do you mind talking a little bit about what's new with you as we uh, wind down here? I just I want people to kind of uh, – and also, of course, you're coming to Canada – which is exciting for people in Vancouver. You're playing just uh, just for last Vancouver. Can you talk a little bit about any upcoming projects that? Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, we're still doing a daily show and we're prepping for midterms. The Dennis Leary project, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a Brooklyn Nine Nine, but set in the world of the National Guard instead of a police department. I think the National Guard is very they're very underappreciated in just the scope of what their job duties are. And I think that it's it's a fun way to also explore government dysfunction, because more often than not, when the National Guard is showing up, it's not just because a tornado tore up something. Most of the time when they're showing up, it's to fix government malfeasance hmm. and things that could have been prevented or shouldn't have happened in the first place. So I think it's a fun way to kind of, you know, sprinkle a little bit of that in there. But ultimately, you know, it's just about show about the people who give up part of their life to help other to help other people there's that and then also my podcast Roy's Job Fair I'm real proud of we've worked very hard at trying to you know explore the world of employment from a prism that you know helps you know helps people feel like they can get by but we make it fun <laughs> there's that uh, there's films and stuff coming up too right um yeah also uh Confess Fletch with John Hamm yeah. um I'll be in which I would assume at some point this year they'll put it out. I know they're starting to screen it and send it around to buyers and investors and all of that jive. So, yeah, so that that's 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 the main stuff right now, man. And you know, I'm just I'm just thankful to be working. Like I don't I don't want to say that I don't care about anything. I do, but I try not to give much thought to what's been done. I try to keep looking forward to, you know, what else I need to, you know, start getting accomplished. Can you just briefly summarize what is Confess Fletch sort of about? Can you share that? Yeah. Um it's a it's a sequel. It's still it's based on the books that the original Chevy Chase run oh, okay. was it based is. on. And yeah. so it's John Hamm stepping in to play the role of Fletch now. You know, Fletch is a journalist and private investigator. He's a journalist who investigates murders and in the film I play a cop that's investigating him, but it's based on the book Confess Fletch. Oh, okay. Cool. So it is I wasn't I saw Fletch and I'm like it must be part of that yeah, series. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's not a direct sequel or anything in that regard either. So I don't want people coming in thinking that it's some sort of like continuation of the second Fletch from, you know, 30 years ago. I think you yeah. have to like reset the machine and, you know, come with something new. Yeah. And I think we were, you know, we were able to do that. 
And you've got a recent comedy special as well that we should tell people about. Yeah, Imperfect Messenger is the uh, comedy special. And it's out on, you can stream Paramount, it on Plus? Paramount Plus. Yeah, yeah, Paramount Plus and all that good stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, Roy, if people want to learn more about you and your comings and goings on their telephones and their computers, where would you like to send them? Um, just my name dot com or put an at symbol in front of it and that's me everywhere okay cool Roy this was a, a great honor and a pleasure I appreciate your time I hope you enjoyed yourself and I wish you the best luck in the future well thank you brother I appreciate it <laughs> Once again, thanks to Roy Wood Jr. for appearing on this, the 690th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode that you've heard about and you're looking for it and uh, it's just not where you think it should be, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. And like Creative Control on Facebook or follow the show on Twitter at vishcreative. Or you can follow me directly on Twitter and on Instagram at Vishkana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to sustain this podcast. All of the work that you hear, all the money that supports that work, it's from the Patreon room. There's a little bit of that ad revenue, but not much. And I'd rather not have any, frankly. Don't let the people who I work with know this. But no, obviously it would be nice if... I could just do this all the time and and support my family and, and, and justify all the effort uh, with a healthier Patreon. And, you know, if you can support it, if you're able to and, and feel like it's worthwhile, I would appreciate it. $6 or more a month grants you access to exclusive content. Some of it derived from these fresh interviews. Some of it uh, re- reflected by, uh, you know, archival stuff I find. You know, I have all these uh, hard drives and folders and they have some of my old audio archives in there and sometimes I post those things. So yeah, $6 or more a month grants you access to that exclusive content and uh, also if you're interested in receiving a Creative Control t-shirt, just message me on Patreon and I will get you one while supplies last. Again, patreon.com slash creative control. Thank you so much for your support. If you're a supporter currently and if you're pondering it, thanks. I appreciate you even pondering it. Thanks again. To Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario, for their in-kind support for this show. Thanks, as always, to my dear small friend, Jim Guthrie, for letting me use some music of, of his on this show. You can learn more about Jim and his big songs. Small man, big songs. You can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you for listening to this episode with Roy Wood Jr. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll check out Roy's work a uh, very prolific and brilliant comedian. I loved this conversation. I've been a fan for some time. So it's nice to have someone that I admire on the show for the first time. That's exciting. So thank you. I hope you uh, will tell your friends about Creative Control and consider subscribing to it or following it as a podcast. And like I say, telling your friends about it and helping to spread the word. Otherwise, I hope you take care of yourself and be kind to one another. Be safe. Be sane. It's a very hard world out there, but I think... As long as we do the things I just said, maybe that'll help. I don't know. Talk to you very soon. Bye for now.